Okay, so we're going to start off. The heck with Fred. Fred's bailed. So we're going to start off with Bob Pony. We're going to start off the talk. Yes, Fred. Okay. Uh, good. You saved everybody from another bad joke. I was stalling for you. Uh, so I think we have a pair of speakers tonight that are going to be talking about burning then and now on the Upper Texas Coast. So we have Fred Collins and Bob Pony. Tim, uh, thank you everyone for showing up. Um, this is going to automate the slide again. So, so the, the uh, idea for this talk came when I came into possession of this 50 year old, roughly, bird finding guide put out by the Ornithology Group of, of the Houston Outdoor Nature Club. And I thought, gee, there's probably some interesting information here that, that birders would like to know about, how things were 50 years ago and how things have changed. Um, and it, it looked like good fodder for a talk. Um, problem was, I wasn't around 50 years ago, so I recruited Fred, who grew up in this area, and he can speak and will speak to a lot of what we're going to address today um, 50 years ago firsthand. Uh, I moved into this area in the early 1980s. Uh, so, Good Birding Trips was written in 1967, 1968, and it was written by individual members of the ornithology group. It cost two dollars, and the proceeds went to support the ornithology group activity. And what we're going to be showing you today is how things have changed over the last 50 years. Uh, sometimes for the better, oftentimes with habitat loss, the story is not quite so happy. Um, this is kind of just a quick example of how things have changed on the Katy Prairie. Um, 1950s, 1940s up at the top, uh, 2016 at the bottom. You can see how much development has chewed up habitat out there. We've used imagery from Google Earth to make these comparisons. So with that, whenever you see this slide, it means we have to change speakers and make sure we don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> There's been an overall decline in bird species, or birds, bird species too for that matter, but bird numbers um, in, the, in the past 50 years. I, can you all hear me without? Yeah. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. There, okay. I'll do this. Uh, uh, anyway, there's been a, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of loss of habitat due to urbanization, and then the habitat has been further degraded, just not by loss, but by things like a lot more cats roaming around the city, uh, a lot more windows for birds to fly into, just a lot more pavement, um, uh, cell towers, power lines, et cetera, et cetera, you can read them up there. And generally we found, studies have found breeding bird surveys and uh, study of uh, Christmas count data and whatnot, there, most songbirds have declined uh, at least 40%. Uh, go to the next slide, Bob. Uh, some, some really common things, it's even worse. Uh, one of the things that's really startling is gray tail, or common grapples have had a 50% decline since 1970. That's pretty significant. And now they're being listed as threatened by the IUCN. And uh, uh, the suspicion is that pest control uh, may be responsible for that. Uh, next slide, Bob. Um, also, uh, Rufus Hummingbird. Rufus Hummingbird is one of those species that was not here in the 60s. They learned to winter in our urban gardens. They become the most common winter hummingbird all over the southeastern United States, including Texas, 
they went all the way up into New York City. So on the face of it, it seems like, oh, they're doing great. But uh, they, uh, people are so concerned about those in, in California with the breeding bird surveys and whatnot, they're afraid that that bird could go extinct in front of our eyes. And what's interesting, I was at the Nature Discovery Center in Bel Air uh, for eight years, and uh, we had winter populations of between 13 and 20 individuals in the park. I left there, and each year there were fewer hummingbirds, and I thought, they're not taking care of them right, something's wrong, what's going on? Well, now they're doing good to have three or four in the winter, but it has nothing to do with them. It has a lot to do with the overall decline of the species. Uh, there's been a lot of things that have uh, disappeared that were here locally um, for unexplicable reasons in some cases. Uh, purple sandpiper uh, appeared in the early 70s. First, some of the first records for Texas were on the upper Texas coast. And for about a 10 year period, they were on, on some jetty on the upper Texas coast or multiple jetties and sometimes multiple birds on one jetty for about the next 20 years. But since about 1990, they've more or less disappeared. Uh, Northern Jacana, a population was discovered uh, about 1980, I think, maybe a little earlier than that, down in Pretoria County. They were at uh, Manor Lake. The population was very sizable, maybe 20 pair, maybe more. Uh, there was a really bad freeze in 83, and it was followed by another bad freeze in 89, and that decimated the water hyacinth, completely changed the habitat there, and those birds disappeared. Uh, Eskimo curlew, uh, nobody's really sure why that bird disappeared. It was obviously decimated at the turn of the 20th century, uh, for the 19th century, I don't know how you say that. What, what anyway, market hunting in the late 1800s uh, decimated most of the shorebirds. The shorebirds recovered, but not the Eskimo curly, for reasons unknown. What did you um, call that? Market hunting? What did you call that? What did you call that? What did you say? Market hunting? Market hunting. Market. Market hunting. eating them. They were eating them. People, people used to shoot shorebirds to eat. They're delicious. Uh, <laughs> How do you know? And, and, they, and they were hunted in huge numbers. Uh, anyway, uh, that's all another story. I'll never get through the program. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, the Atwater Prairie Chicken. Uh, at one time, there were a million of them on the coastal prairies. And today there's, you know, three or four hundred that they released this past uh, this past fall, and that's that's all there are. The ones that they release every year, make a lot of them. And then there's some other things that, while they're not uh, extinct by any situation, they they've declined for various reasons dramatically, and that would include the king rail and the fullest whistling duck. <coughs> Purple finch, we find we had the best year ever for purple finch this past winter, but that's a complete anomaly. It goes completely against the grain of everything. Uh, hairy woodpecker has has kind of just disappeared from Texas forest for the most part. Rusty blackbird is in decline. Uh, and then Henslow sparrow actually bred on the upper Texas coast in some of the tall brush prairies out near Hobby Airport and nobody's seen those birds since the early 90s. Okay. Um, I started watching birds in the, uh, in the 60s, all through the 60s, I was a bird watcher. And uh, the thought that you could find a peregrine falcon in your lifetime, or see a bald eagle in Texas, um, was, was, you know, it was a pipe dream almost. Uh, when I grew up on the bay, and in the in the fifties, in my earliest remembrances, there were brown pelicans everywhere. In the sixties, they disappeared from the bay, so they were gone. And that was because of DDT. Well, they banned DDT. Finally, realized what was going on, and it was banned. And now all these birds. Next slide. 
uh, all these birds have come back. And uh, today, these birds are all common birds. And it's remarkable to me every time I see one because it wasn't that way. I went with John Smith, who was the first Texas Park and Wildlife uh, endangered species biologist that they hired. I think that was in 1970, and I think in 71 or 72. I went with him to help him investigate a bald eagle nest down near Victoria. And at that time, there were only seven known bald eagle nests in the state of Texas. Today, there's seven on Lake Houston, I think. Next slide. Um, but uh, in addition to all those birds that were depressed by DDT, uh, we've had some other birds show up that were not here 50 years ago. And primarily those are two groups of birds. Those that have moved north from the tropics, part of the global warming process, and the other is introduced species that have spread into Texas or the Houston area. Uh, some of these you may be surprised at. Uh, we started doing the uh, Katy Perry Christmas bird count in 78, and, or 77, one of, those two, one of those two. Anyway, the second year we got one pair of para, and I don't think we got it again for several years. We finally got another one. Well, now we get, you know, like 50 on the count. Every party gets multiple birds. Uh, black bellied whistling duck moved into the Texas coast in the late 1960s. That was at the same time period that Fulvis whistling duck was almost annihilated because Fulvis whistling duck had this bad habit of attacking uh, newly planted rice fields. And as soon as the farmer planted the rice, the Fulvis whistling ducks would come in in great numbers and they would forage all that rice. So what did the rice farmers do? They started poisoning the rice. It would still germinate and grow, but if the ducks ate it, adios. And so the fullest whistling duck population was almost down to zero, and the black belly whistling ducks showed up on the upper Texas coast. So they expanded and they changed their behavior and habitat. And in Mexico, they had not gone into rice fields. Now they would go into rice fields, but they didn't go in and decimate this rice. Of course, people figured out what was going on, and that was the foul law that it provided this window of opportunity that the black belly and whistling duck exploited. Uh, black belly whistling duck traditionally had only nested in holes and trees. Uh, early studies in Texas in the 1970s by Doug Slack from A&M uh, discovered that they were nesting out in the open on rice fields, which is where Fulvis whistling ducks used to nest. So it was an interesting behavioral change also. Uh, white-winged doves, I was working on a white-winged dove project in Mexico in 1968, 69, and banning white-winged doves and all the authorities of white-winged dove in the state of Texas and the United States were highly concerned that white-winged doves had the same <coughs> Uh, all the traits that the passenger pigeon did, in which they breed in these really large, large colonies, up to a million birds in Mexico, and the synergy of that colony provided the productivity. And they were being decimated in Mexico at the time by hunters. They hunted them all through the breeding season, they hunted them in the breeding colony. So there was great concern that bird was going to go extinct. But what happened? They're not extinct, are they? <laughs> With a major switch in the behavior of white-winged doves, uh, they had adapted over time in the lower valley <laughs> to living in Brownsville and living in the uh, orange orchards in close association with people out of their natural brush habitat. And apparently these white-winged doves figured out, hey, these urban environments are just fine and they made the jump into urban environments and they had a huge amount of habitat to exploit, which they have. So that's been a change. We've talked a little bit about Rufus Hummingbird. Uh, Cape Swallow is another bird that changed its behavior. It was 
confined to sinkholes and caves in the southwest. Again, sometime in the early 70s, they were discovered nesting in some culverts in the hill country close to natural caves. And over a matter of, it, it, they slowly progressed, filled up the hill country, and then they started expanding out of the hill country. And within 20 years, they were all the way down to a boat shed uh, on the Sabine River. So they had completely expanded all of that area, and they learned to exploit that kind of habitat. So now we have them on the upper Texas coast. They weren't here. Uh, some other species that are, have, have crept north and jumped north in some cases, uh, great piscidae, tropical kingbird, and couches kingbird. Uh, these species were not common in uh, Corpus Christi in 1970. Uh, tropical kingbird, I don't even think it was in the valley in 1970. So uh, these birds have leapfrogged and all the way up to the upper Texas coast and beyond. And Great Kiskadee jumped all the way into Louisiana. Captain's Kingbird has been a little bit more methodical, but it's, it's swept up and taken off almost the entire southern half of the state where it once was confined to the valley. Uh, so they've really moved. And we have some new exotic species that have shown up fairly recently. Uh, monk parakeets, they, they were, uh, I'm not sure they were known to be very established anywhere in, in the Houston area until maybe like about 1980. But there were thousands of them imported in the 1970s and they were, um, uh, they were, I think $2 a piece in boxes of 100 and bird shops would buy them and they would ship them across the country. And they got established in the United States first by one of these cases of a hundred parakeets uh, being busted open at one of the airports. And instead of going through quarantine into the pet stores, a hundred newly imported birds from Argentina that were paired up already and knew what they were doing, they, they dispersed into Chicago and they figured out, the parrots were so smart, they figured out that they could sit on the power transformers. Uh, there's a, a, a cooling system in there, a radiator, and all they have to do is go sit on that radiator and that they take that heat out of that radiator, keeps their bodies warm, and they can su survive the winter in Chicago without any protection at all. So first thing you know, they learned that and now you find uh, monk parakeets in most of the transfer stations in the country. Although the new design is trying to eliminate a <coughs> we'll um, Some of these other birds, scaly breasted munia has been imported in large numbers, and that bird seems to have firmly established itself. Uh, Northern Red Bishop, the first record was down near the turning basin on the Houston Ship Channel in 1958 and they have persisted there since that time and only recently have they started expanding and Houston Audubon started a, a study of those birds four years ago now to try and determine the extent of the population and the spread of that population. They're considered uh, invasive and a bad bird in other places that they have become established around ports but in Houston they haven't demonstrated any of those qualities in spite of the fact that the population has been there now for 60 years and it's expanding, so we'll see what happens. Um, and then Egyptian goose is another uh, bird that um, has, has slowly and quietly uh, gotten established. It was a popular bird. It's a pretty bird, as you can see. It's a small goose. It's actually not a goose. It's a shell bug. It was popular with waterfowlers. It got fairly cheap because they're not particularly good pets. Um, and so people kind of didn't care if they kept them. And those birds have snuck in and out of our parks and become highly established. And, and we didn't even know that they were really free flying almost, yet they, they are, and they're, they're expanding. 
uh, Orange, uh, Orange Bishop, which is now called, they changed the name, Northern Red Bishop, um, is a bird that seemed to be very established on our water detention facilities. But uh, with, the, with the floods, the, the three years floods and a, and a severe winter in between there, these birds seem to be have disappeared, so maybe they're not here anymore. Next slide. And then some others that uh, uh, people don't realize always, great-tailed grackle, uh, you know, you think, well, they were always here, right? When I was a kid, the only place you could see great-tailed grackles in Houston was at the alligator uh, exhibit in the Houston Zoo. They weren't anywhere else. They were really, it was really cool to go over there and see this great big grackle. Uh, not so cool anymore, is it? Uh, Ted Liebert showed up in Texas in 1957. They uh, exploded in population, established a lot of new egret colonies. That was also in the height of the DDT, but they didn't partake of that because they primarily stayed out with the cattle in pastures and didn't get them into the wetlands. And so they were uh, kind of immune to that. And they established a lot of inland nesting colonies. Uh, they don't necessarily have to have an island in the middle of the water to, to nest. They'll nest in an isolated group of trees and do fairly well. When the other herons started recovering from the DDT depression, uh, they used those cattleaver colonies. Well, cattleaver have stabilized and they're actually declining a little bit now. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where they fit 50 years from now. The Eurasian collar dove moved in spread all across the state of Texas uh, sometime after 2005, happened very rapidly. And then the uh, house finch, a native bird to West Texas, the western half of Texas, the ones we have in Houston are not from there. They're from the birds that were introduced in New York and over the ensuing 75 years have spread across the United States and they got to Houston in 1988. So they've been here since 1988. Okay, so now that we've heard about some of the species, I, I can do it. Go ahead. Um, let's get to some of the hot spots and how they have differed from 50 years ago to now. This is the table of contents from that 50 year old bird finding guide. Um, you can see there's a different name next to each chapter. Individuals in the club uh, took on the responsibility of writing things up. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Excuse me, yeah. um, these are the areas that that book covered. Uh, concentrated uh, east and southeast of Houston, a couple scattered spots to the west, and they even went out as far as uh, Palmetto State Park up uh, your Gonzales and um, I'm not sure, I think that might be Wake Corpus Christi. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's down in the brush country. Um, next. So just some of the interesting things they did. Uh, one of the places they recommended 50 years ago to go was the North and South Boulevard area in Houston. And interestingly, in addition to creating a checklist of birds for 1965 to 1967, they put in a map of every single tree in that square block. They mark the location of a tree and the species of the tree for people uh, who had botanical interests, I guess. They have, they have a phone where a bird was saying, like, right. It's a bird in the low quad. <laughs> yeah. Next. So this is what it looks like 50 years ago or so, and today. Um, you know, the, the tree cover doesn't appear to be all that much different, um, but despite that there hasn't been much change, we have, we have better places to go in Houston now, uh, better alternatives. We have Russ Pittman Park um, on the right, um, Rice University campus on the left. Um, 
Next. That's true, that's true. But there are rookery alternatives to that as well. <laughs> um, the rookery that was addressed in detail in that 50-year-old bird guide was out near Rosenberg. And you had to take uh, US 59 out and then go, go onto this farm road, an unmarked farm road, cross a track into a cotton field, follow the road to the mailboxes and turn left. <laughs> <clears throat> but now, similar to <clears throat> the, the in-town alternatives that we have to, to places like North Boulevard, um, we have some great rookery alternatives today. Um, Fiorenza Park out on the west side of town. Next slide. Um, this is out near uh, the West Park Toll Road in Eldridge um, and the big rookery this is Fiorenza Park, and the rookery is a little bit west of there. Marianne does a monthly survey out there. Um, if you want to participate in that, uh, check it out on the uh, Houston Audubon website. Uh, but thousands of birds um, nest in that rookery. Next. Uh, Brazos Bend State Park has a great rookery viewing opportunity uh, down in Fort Bend County. Uh, if you compare these old and new maps, the park itself hasn't changed very much over 50 years. Um, but you can see a lot of development creeping in toward its boundaries um, in the surrounding landscape. Yeah, and the, and the fields are getting fragmented, as Fred pointed out. Yeah. Next. And... <coughs> Of course, there's Audubon's High Island Sanctuary. And Fred's gonna talk more about that in a, in a bit. Um, anyway, one of the other um, um, points that they had in the manual and it was a big deal back in the 60s is when this hired a local birder uh, who got out and, and traveled more than most birders at the time you know going to in 1967 if somebody decided they were going to go all the way to north and south boulevard that was a trek <laughs> but linda snyder lived in la porte so she was already out in the country and so she came up with this loop and uh, it's the loop that I think a lot of y'all have driven at various times. You'd go out to I-10 and turn south at Hankamer, go by White Memorial Park and cut across 1985 to Anahuac and go down to Highland and then drive down the Bolivar Peninsula, take the ferry over and go home on 45. So that was, uh, that was the uh, beginning of regular bird watching in the area and that's the route that I ran a, a really long time. Um, it was a great big day loop because you've got lots of different habitat and one of the first stops on it was White Memorial Park and you can see this December 69 picture which would be all the trees were bare and uh, uh, and it's black and white it's hard to see it it doesn't look like it's that dense and of course it wasn't that dense as you can see in June of 2005 because all those trees in that park were huge, beautiful hardwoods. Some of the biggest, most beautiful trees you ever saw. Swamp chestnut oaks that were four feet in diameter, more than 100 feet tall, just beautiful stuff down there. Magnolias that were hundreds and hundreds of years old where barred owls nested. It was a great park. But then, we had uh, Katrina in 2005, uh, right after this photograph. Uh, we had Rita, we had Hugo, and we had Harvey. And uh, a lot of those trees were severely damaged and had to be cut down and removed out of the park. And so today when you drive in there, the park's a shadow of what it once was. 
but it's still an interesting place to go. There's brown headed nut hatches in there. Um, and along Turtle Bio, there's still some of those birds that would use that biohabitat. Still a good stop, but it's dramatically changed. Okay. Uh, then down on that route, you would go to Anahuac Wildlife Refuge. Always get confused what I'm looking at on this slide. These green lines have got me fouled up. But anyway, um, yeah, I know that's what, that's what messes me up. Um, see, I can't see the original. And, and, oh, here it is, oh, here. This piece right here, yeah, this piece right here, not counting that piece up above there, and it goes above that horizontal green line. That was the original Anahuac Wildlife Refuge in 1969. And um, over the years, they've expanded that. But that was the first access people had to uh, that kind of habitat. So it was an important spot. You could drive down and be right there in those salt marshes. And Shovel Pond was astounding. Uh, anybody ever wonder why it's called Shovel Pond? Anybody know the answer? In 1967, every winter would have like 20,000 northern shovelers on it and almost nothing else. It was an open pond, not that much emergent vegetation, and it was just full of shovelers. Um, anyway, over time they've expanded the refuge dramatically, as you can see with all these green lines. That's all federal property now, and it's all part of the Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge system more than twice as much acreage that they had originally. Uh, and then we get to High Island. Um, at High Island in 1967, this is what you did. You turn left at Brandon Drugstore, which is the green building, and go 0.3 miles, turn left and go 0.2 miles to Brandon's house. Introduce yourself to the owners. And then they had a small, amount of, uh, you can just barely see a little bit of, of, uh, of black spots and, and a line of black of trees right there above the word high island. And that was where you could go birding. And notice that there's not very many black spots on that map. There's only a couple of patches here and there of dark spots, which were trees. And now if we look at it today, look at all of that dark spots, which is trees. And you have access to all of those trees, thanks to use an autopensive side. So it's a it, it's it's dramatically different experience going to Highland today compared to going to Highland in 1970. Um, we got permission from Lewis Smith in the early 70s to go onto his property, which today we call Boy Scout Woods. And he was working for the oil company down there, and he was running <coughs> test gardens for them. And uh, uh, the first time I went on that property, he had planted a bunch of mulberry trees that were about the size of a pencil and about two feet tall and line down there. And those are the mulberry trees next to the bleachers today. So it's changed a lot. But now this is Bolivar Flats. This is an area that's changed dramatically too. In the uh, early 70s, uh, Roseanne Rowlett, who's a heck of a bird watcher, bird uh, aficionado. Uh, she was one of the people that started Field Guides uh, birding tours, which is, uh, leads tours all over the world that she has for her for the last 40 years or so. But and at this point in time, she was working for Edgar Kincaid, who was trying to put the finishing touches on Bird Life of Texas, and she also, she left Edgar when that project was done in 72, 
and she went over to the general land office and started working for the general land office. And they were looking at these title lands that were owned by the state of Texas. She initiated a, a shorebird survey on, on Bolivar Flat. And so we started doing Bolivar, we started doing shorebird surveys out there about 1972. And that a lot, and, and those shorebird surveys led to a lot of different things in the land office changing their opinion about these coastal bird areas, and most of them are preserved today. And it all started with there. And fortunately, Houston Audubon, at some point or other, was able to buy the land that's not owned by the state of Texas, which is where that is, changes every year. <laughs> um, but suffice to say that Audubon owns more property every year and the state of Texas owns less in this particular area. But um, you can see where the beach is, uh, how far it goes down from Redland Road and where, the, um, and where the beach stops, so to speak. And here's the jetty over here. And now look at things today. The beach comes almost all the way down here at times to the jetty. All of this has become vegetated. So once upon a time, the best place to go see birds was down the Ritalin Road. And today, the easiest place to see birds is off the jetty. Because they're closer to the action. So. This, this is a picture from the jetty. You can see that the birds come, come right up to the jetty. Uh, it's much more comfortable walking and it's much, much, uh, much safer and easier. Here's a clapperill up on the jetty and here's some of the birds that you can see uh, uh, right here from the jetty. And Bob wants to tell a story. Yeah. How can you tell the difference between a male and female abbasid? Curve of the bill. You got it. <laughs> I've got a ringer in the audience. <laughs> which is which? Female is more curved. That's right. The female has more curves. <laughs> Females always have those little cute upturned noses, right? <laughs> right. Next slide. Um, so uh, then after the big route leaves Bolivar, they go to uh, Galveston. And in Galveston, there were two places listed that you could go birding. One of them was East Beach, and the other was Kempner Park. Uh, I want you to notice what we have on there now are all the different places that are open to the public that you can go and watch birds in Galveston today. Remarkably different. Uh, East Beach has a story similar to Bolivar Flats and that over time, the, uh, uh, the way the jetties operate, whatnot, the land has built up. Uh, when I first went down there in the 60s, actually before that, I went down there when I was a very young kid and wandered around looking for bird eggs. But anyway, um, down there by the jetty, you can see that dark line right next to the jetty? That was a cut and water flowed through there. And so 99.9% .9 of the people never went beyond the jetty. And that, that island out there was a great nesting bird island. It was full of black skimmers and gullbill terns and lease terns. Uh, it was a spectacular place. But over time, that silt has filled in. And now you can't even see that line between the, the jetties completely buried up there. And so that area is no longer isolated and it's no longer used by those nesting birds. Um, Are you saying that, I know that says 2017, so do you have any information about, I mean, we would all love to think that we're getting more land and not less land according to climate change. So are you saying that from 2017 to 2019, there's been no recession, there's no been low loss of the land in that area? Do you know? Um, we don't, I don't have, we didn't have pictures, images in 
2019 compared to this? Yeah, yeah we, we, uh, we just have to take whatever Google has posted at the time. And their current stuff, they add to periodically, but it's not, uh, we, I don't, I, you know, we don't know when they're going to post the next picture, and we don't know what year it's going to be. That's the most recent picture you can see on Google of that site. Okay. At least when we put this talk together, when? Yeah, which was a year ago now. <laughs> so there's, so maybe there's a new image up now, I don't know. They put them up pretty regular now, but there's no predicting when they're going to put what up. Of course, they concentrate on <coughs> urban areas, and these places like this, it's a different process. Also, I'm, I'm, over two years, I'm not sure you'd see that much difference. But also, what, what, you, what may result in a visual difference yeah. over a short time period might just be whether a picture was taken at yeah. high tide versus low tide. Yeah. What, which um, can make a huge difference in the Yeah. And, 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 and that's, you know, under most circumstances, to, two years and five years, you can't really see any difference. What you can see difference in is every hurricane. And when a hurricane hits the area, there's a huge change, and it's sort of permanent. And then, when the next one comes along, it changes again. So you can look at you can look at 50 years fairly well, but looking at 10 years it doesn't tell you as much of the story. Uh, this is Kentner Park, and oh, we didn't mark it on there. I can't find it. Uh, it's over in the right, right upper right. right. Keep going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, yeah, it is marked. Okay. It's over there. Uh, if you look at this picture from, these are backwards. This is 74. The black and white is 74. And the one up on top is 2017. And if you look at these, you notice there's really not very much difference. And then the other thing, people always talk about Kempner Park, but when you birded Kempner Park, you walked around this, this house and the gardens. And this is where a lot of the birds that say Kempner Park are actually seen is in these flower beds of this house, as opposed to Kempner Park. But both areas are still pretty much like they always were but you don't see as many birds when you go there. And the reason for that is, if we looked at an entire map of Galveston, we would find that trees and residential areas have greatly expanded. Uh, remember that there's 40% fewer birds. And so when you go to Kempner Park today, the concentration is not at all like what it once was. And so you don't see birds in the same relationship that you did the first time I went there. The first time I went there was with an OG field trip. We had 21 species of warbler in the park, right there in that one park. Had, uh, that list has either four or five cerulean warblers, which was a lifer on that trip for me. And I can't remember some of the other numbers, but there were a lot of birds is the point. <coughs> Uh, Lafitte's Cove, uh, uh, you can see it up here in 1968. If you use your imagination, you can see it. <coughs> Lafitte's Cove was a series of old sand dune ridges with these intermittent swales, which were freshwater marshy ephemeral habitat. And it's good habitat. Uh, not necessarily for migrants, but it's excellent habitat for wildlife and birds and clapper rails and uh, leaf bitterns and things like that. George Mitchell on that property, he's from Galveston, he really wanted to develop it. He got crosswise with Fish and Wildlife Service, he got crosswise with Houston Audubon Society. They were trying to keep him from building this. George Mitchell, of course, by that time was a, was a very uh, wealthy man. He was very interested in Galveston, and he wanted to build this for Galveston, and it kind of became a pride thing with him, and he didn't care what happened. He was going to build that. 
Well, they beat the poor man up so bad that he ended up having to surrender 50% of the property to mitigation. And you can see just this handful of scattered trees up there in the top of that corner by that white spot. That was what trees were there. And of course, after they developed all this and protected those trees, people planted more trees and the trees were protected and they grew up and expanded. They were watered. Uh, they put in nice concrete walkways for us. Uh, they put in drips. They maintain it. And now it's one of the most popular burning sites on the upper Texas coast. Um, and uh, the neighborhood produces a fair amount of birds as well. So it's a good burning site. And then they preserved all of, a lot of these swales were preserved in here. This is the same swale that you can see up there on that map, the top one. So a lot of that habitat was preserved and it was made accessible for people to go bird watching there. Okay, uh, Lafitte's Cove. Oh yeah, this is this is this is just the progression of how that all came about. Uh, what it looked like originally in '89, they started developing in '95. Here it was in 2004 and 2005. Why don't we have those close together, Bob? I think I think that last picture is supposed to be. I think it's it's 10 years old, but newer than that. Um, okay, Galveston Island State Park is an interesting story. It was uh, one of the larger tracts of land that was acquired by the public on Galveston Island. And on that top slide, when it was, uh, uh, this was right before it opened, notice how uniform it is and how light colored it is. That represents big expanses of, of coastal prairie and, and coastal marsh. It was a very pristine place. That's what a lot of Galveston looked like once upon a time. <clears throat> this is what it looks like more or less today. And uh, this slide's kind of dark, it's hard to see. But notice it's no longer smooth and uniform and it's all dappled and dark in a lot of cases. And those are trees. And there are also impoundments that were placed in there in a couple of cases. But anyway, because of the circumstance, it's been very hard for them to burn it. And because they were trying to not burn the trees, they didn't burn some places. And if you don't burn a coastal prairie, you lose the coastal prairie. And so unfortunately, although Galveston Island State Park is a great place, it's not it's not what it, what it was originally. And unfortunately, what it was originally is really hard to come by on, on, the, on Galveston and Brazoria, both today, both counties. There's still some in Brazoria, but it's being chopped up as well. So kind of a mixed bag. In 1974, no one had access to that property. Today, we all have access to that property. They have boardwalks. You can go there and get black rail. It's a fun place for bird watchers, but it's not the habitat that Galveston needed. Uh, this is another nice little uh, Ottoman sanctuary. Uh, how many people have been to this sanctuary? Oh, wonderful. I, I can't tell you how many times I, I asked that question and two people in the whole audience raised their hand. This is a great sanctuary. Yeah, it, it's gonna get nothing but better in the future. But it's one of those things that in 1974, it was part of that same complex that Galveston Bay was. And fortunately, it still is, but it does have the salt cedars grown up and Houston Audubon has planted some more trees along the salt cedar. But most of it still goes into the bay the way it was designed to be in the first place. It's a great place to go visit. Take your mosquito repellent. <laughs> Now, this area we're gonna talk about next was on the way back to Houston. And it goes through the coastal prairie. Uh, this is Highway 
six over here that runs through Santa Fe and Alton up that way. And this is uh, 45 uh, that goes up there and 146 up there. Um, if you look at the top map, which was 69, here again, now we don't have a complete picture because all those, all those uh, areas are not available. But where you can see them, notice up there just below League City and West Dickinson, how smooth and gray those are. Tall grass coastal prairie, a lot of it, and it's not damaged too much. Now, my grandfather, sometime around 1915, uh, accompanied a uh, chuck wagon cook on a cattle drive through the Friendswood Prairies. And they would they leave out of uh, Friendswood and they would make a big circle down there around Alvin and Dickinson and come back up toward Paraland where the railroad was up there. And they would gather those cattle up. And my grandfather rode in a Model A behind the herd with the chuck wagon cook. And uh, they would they would hunt prairie chickens all day and feed them to the cowboys that night because cowboys got tired of having beef every night. But that's how common prairie chickens were. You could just pick up enough to feed a whole crew of, of, uh, of cowboys and eat them. So, look, back, back. So, in this area, things that we're going to talk about are the uh, Texas Nature Conservancy, Coastal Prairie Reserve, Ellington Field, Spaceland Airport, and the Henslow Sparrow Field. Okay. Uh, the Henslow Sparrow Field was down at the end of the runway uh, of Hobby Airport. And uh, you can see the, up in the top right hand <coughs> corner is the runway at Hobby. And you can see what's happened in 77. And then you can see what it looks like down here today. And this wasn't discovered until fairly late. Uh, Mike Braun and his brother David were in high school. Mike was in high school, I think David was just starting college. And uh, <coughs> he was at, and this was near their house, and they were he was roaming around out there and he found these birds calling, he couldn't hardly, you know, couldn't figure out what they were. And, he took his brother David out there, and they, they finally said, well, they, they look like him. They must be him. But we think they're Henslow sparrows. Well, nobody, Henslow sparrows don't breed in Texas. These birds were breeding in June down there at the end of Hobby Airport. So they eventually got up the courage to talk to somebody. Everybody went out there. There was a breeding colony of Henslow sparrows there. There were also King Rails breeding out there, uh, Northern Harriers out there, common yellow throats. Uh, Dick Sissels, and I don't remember what all it was. It was, it was a fabulous place. Uh, it was just pristine, tall grass prairie. The, the Florida past pallum was taller than your head. It was a beautiful place. Uh, but anyway, uh, little by little, the development from Hobby came over there and pretty much annihilated it. There happens to be a super fun site right next to it. And the Superfund site about that time was uh, enclosed with a chain link fence with barbed wire on the top and signs all over it. And it proceeded to turn into a Chinese tallow forest. And so that was that was the last nail in the coffin of the Angelo Sparrow field. Okay. <coughs> now in uh, uh, Ellington Field, 1950s, look how smooth and gray all that is. Look at 1977, it's chopped up. But there's still some smooth gray in there, isn't there? And it goes from Ellington Field almost all the way over to Highway, uh, Highway 146. It's a pretty good size area. Um, and then today, uh, we didn't mark it on here, but, uh, or well, this is only the field, but notice how this is not smooth and gray, and notice it's all chopped up, and uh, 
this is not smooth and gray, and that's not smooth and gray. And so today, there's virtually no space there for furniture. Uh, next slide. In uh, 1974, prairie chickens were a real problem for Ellington Field. They were all over the runway and they were causing the Air Force some problems and they were causing NASA some problems with their jets taking off and whatnot. And I was working with the Audubon Society and we wanted to see if we could rescue those chickens in some form or fashion. And I said, what we need to do is we need to get publicity. Lynn Ashby was the most well-known columnist in the city of Houston at the time. And I thought, we'll just get, I'll get Lynn Ashby to go out there. So I call him up and I talk him into the story and he's interested in the story. And I said, great, I'll pick you up and take you out there. And uh, he said, okay, well fine, what time? I said, well, I'll pick you up at five. <laughs> and there's a long silence on the phone. He says, you don't mean five in the morning. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he says, I don't do mornings forever. <laughs> well, I took him out there. We couldn't see chickens, but he wrote a story Unfortunately, it didn't do much good. Um, but eventually, Texas Parks and Wildlife went out there, trapped a bunch of prairie chickens, declared the population extinct, and hauled those prairie chickens to Atwater where they disappeared for the most part. But some of them went into a breeding program. Uh, but anyway, that's what happened to Elliott Field. Didn't they go to Texas City also? Hmm? Didn't they go to Texas City also? No, Texas, Texas City wasn't anything yet. Okay, Spaceland Airport was just south of Ellington Field at the Dickinson exit, I think. It was one between, uh, no, yeah, it was before Dickinson. There was an exit between Dickinson and NASA. And at that exit, there was this little private airport. And there it is in 1968. Notice it's surrounded by all this nice gray color up there. <clears throat> and there's the little airport. And uh, back in the day, if you were on your way to Galveston and wanted to see prairie chickens, you just got off the highway, ran over there, drove out on the runway because it was a small airport and they didn't operate before, before dawn or anything, or before about eight o'clock. And so we just pulled right out there on the runway and the prairie chickens would dance all around your car and everything. <laughs> Many as 20 at a time, and we could get prairie chickens real fast and buzz our way down to Galveston to, to make the loop on the birdie today. Uh, now, look what's happened to Spaceland today. It, it would be somewhere about right here. Y'all recognize what those are. Those are neighborhoods with houses all over. So that's what happened to those two. How are we doing on time? Okay. 20 minutes. Okay, so um, one of the more interesting uh, bits of information in this 50-year-old birding guide uh, was in fact right about this Spaceland Airport area and specifically J.D. Woodham's ranch where people would go to see prairie chickens. So um, the directions are you, you take this route and you go to the sign that says saws sharpened and then you drive into the house and ring the doorbell and you have an opportunity to see prairie chickens either real early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Next. So um, as the description says, they would feed and display at such close range. There's a blind, there was a photographer's blind that seated five people, but you could also go inside the house and just watch them through the windows where they'd be fed. And uh, as it says, approximately 20 persons could view the prairie chickens from the dinner and or the kitchen. So uh, J.D. would have estimated that in that area indicated by that three mile line, there were about 600 prairie chickens. That was between Farm Road 1266 and Highway 146. He fed them as much as 100 pounds of grains we grain weekly. Um, he had 
a stuffed bird that was a prime exhibit uh, to the visitors to his house, um, one that was killed in combat with another male, um, and he used it in lectures, and he raised a lot of money, over $100,000 he raised to donate to wildlife conservation. Um, and that was at the time of publication of this book. Um, how much longer this went on, he may have raised the whole chunk of money more. And now, as Fred pointed out, um, this right here is where the house was, and this is what the area looks like now. All that habitat is lost. So that, that's something you all need to keep in mind as you think about the importance of, of the conservation efforts we all do. Um, as far as efforts to try to keep the prairie chickens going, uh, Texas City Prairie Reserve, Preserve <coughs> Nature Conservancy property was established. And uh, for a while there were prairie chickens, I, was it from the captive breeding program? The, the no, no, they were, they were there. Oh, they were actually there, okay. They were actually there. Okay, um, but that population has dwindled and is no longer there. Um, Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge, um, the only ref national wildlife refuge I know that's got the name of the bird wrong, it's Atwater instead of Atwaters. <laughs> but uh, that was established, um, in part because of the prairie chicken populations out there. And as Fred has mentioned a couple times, that that population there is basically kept going by reintroductions of, of uh, several hundred birds every year, because the ones that are, that are out there, their survival rate is very, very low. They were hit especially hard by, by Hurricane Harvey. But, but one thing that's interesting is, is that the world population of Atwater prairie chickens today, uh, about 90 plus percent of the birds are descendants of eggs mm -hmm. taken off of the Texas City uh, Prairie Preserve, which is the last place that prairie chickens were breeding on their own. Yeah. 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 The, cap the captive breeding program produces a lot of birds every year. It's very successful. And and that's, that's the hope for this bird at, at, at the Houston Zoo and at, at Fossil Rim. Next. So another area um, that we wanted to talk about before we finish up tonight is out on the Katy Prairie, west of Houston. Um, you I remember the slide I showed at the beginning showing all the development out there, but you know there's some good, good things going on out there as well. Next. Back 50 years ago, these were the areas that the birding guide called attention to. You had in the blue bald eagles, uh, people would go up to Warren Lake and nearby areas similar to where birders go today. Um, the rice fields that they pointed out were a little bit south of where where most people that I'm aware of go today, down right around Old Town Katy. No rice fields in that immediate area right now. And down, uh, down south on uh, FM 1093, um, extension of, of Westheimer. And then prairie chickens um, on Clay Road, right near Barker Cypress. <laughs> Next. So this is, uh, a succession of four photographs, uh, four aerial images of how um, things have changed from 1943 to 2006. Um, the red circle is the edge of the Cypress Creek Christmas bird count, just to give you a kind of a locational reference for those of you who are familiar with that CBC. Um, and you see that over the years that uh, Development has spread farther west, and uh, habitat has been fragmented. Also notice how all these houses have built up on the back side of that uh, uh, Barker. All right, yeah, Barker. <coughs> um, 
This is actually Attic's Reservoir right here. Barker Reservoir's down here. And, and they built up, right? And, and of course, you know, been in the news a lot lately with regard to flooding and, and whether whether they should have been ever allowed to build there in the first place. So this is a closer look at how some of the things have changed. Um, notice you not only have that smooth gray texture that Fred has pointed out um, that indicates this nice prairie habitat back in 1943, but it's what you can see is not simply prairie, but a wetland prairie mosaic. You have these depressional wetlands that provided an abundance of habitat for water birds. Um, 25 years later, or is that, I guess that's 35 years later, um, still a lot of open land, but you can see that agricultural practices have diminished the amount of, of uh, depressional wetlands. Rice, yeah, rice culture um, came in that area. And, yep, yeah, and you know, the rice is what brought the geese in. Um, the geese that made the prairie, Katy Prairie in particular, uh, a destination for a lot of people. Um, and now with rice farming on the decline, the goose population out there has moved elsewhere largely. Next. So 1988 now on the right, and you can see further changes, more development creeping in from the east, and the next, and 2019, this area south of Cyprus um, is mostly subdivisions. So on a larger scale, um, this is what the Katy Prairie looks like uh, just a few years ago. Um, the area that we were looking at in that close up was just above my hand up there. Um, next, um, we'll go through another sequence. Uh, the left, the, the western side of this image, those, those areas, there were no images available for 1940s. Um, the blue, the yellow circle is, again, the Cypress Creek Christmas bird count circle. The blue circle in the lower right is the, the Buffalo Bayou Christmas bird count circle. Next. So 1988, um, some things have already started changing. Next. Pay attention mostly to the east side as the development creeps out. 1998. Next, 2008, one more, and 2016. Um, but on a very positive note, the areas you see outlined in the middle of the Christmas bird count circle are areas that have been protected by the Katy Perry Conservancy. Um, also a small area down here. Um, Little over 20,000 acres, combination of land that KPC owns and conservation easements lands. So, you know, there are, there are positive things happening. Um, more land now has formal protection as the year goes on, but the problem we face is that much, most of the land, maybe that is habitat for birds and other wildlife is in private hands. And the habitat loss, even though there may be more areas accessible to birders and wildlife watchers um, and under formal protection, the amount of habitat keeps getting less and less. So um, next, oh, continued threats. Um, some of you may be aware of this, but that red line, um, indicates a proposed TxDOT expansion of FM 529, which can only mean more traffic, more development out there. 
Uh, the thicker part of the red line on the right between uh, the Grand Parkway and uh, Katie Hockley Cutoff Road. Um, they're expanding. They propose to expand from two lanes to six lanes. Um, <coughs> west from Katie Hockley Cutoff Road out to FM 362 from two lanes to four lanes. Um, they propose an 18 foot wide median and amazingly to me, sidewalks the entire length of this. Um, can't mean good things for the habitat. And that red square in the middle of things is a section of land that's up for sale that KPC is hoping somehow they can get some protection for rather than having it sold to a developer. But uh, um, as you can see, um, those of us with, with KPC uh, are very concerned about that right in the middle of all the land we work so hard to uh, protect. Next. So um, on the good side of things, there, there have been some improvements for, you know, Fred mentioned the, the uplisting of, of the common grackle and the uh, Rufus Hummingbird to near threatened state status. Um, but, but some good things have been happening. Uh, Red-headed woodpecker, Henslow sparrow, range wide, certainly not specifically in the area that Fred talked about. Uh, painted bunting and Bell's area have been, <coughs> have made some recoveries and have been downlisted to a species of least concern. But there are other species that, so where did the Henslow Sparrow move to when it left that habitat? Where did it move? Um, where's, where's the main part of the Henslow Sparrow range? Uh, this population in Houston was 600 miles south of the other closest known population in Oklahoma. And they occur from there all up in through the Ohio Valley and Prairie all the way up Prairie Gap. I know, but you talked earlier about how they were over by Javi Airport. Javi Airport, and they got. So where where they, if there's no least concern, where are they? The, the birds that have been here, they're gone. They're, gone. they're not. They they I, they were probably a unique subspecies that was unique to the to the coastal prairies, just like the outwater prairie chicken is unique to the coastal prairies, as opposed to the greater prairie chicken that occurs all up through the central plains. But they were. We never had enough of them that we were studying long enough to determine if they were in fact a unique subspecies. So anyway, um, there are a number of other species that have also uh, been uplisted to to species of concern or more serious status. Ch status uh, chimney swift. Evening Grosbeak got listed to vulnerable. Eastern Meadowlark, Chuckles, Widow, Harris' Sparrow, not on this slide, Black Pole Warbler, um, Eastern Whippoorwill, um, all uplisted to near threat. Can, can you imagine prairies without Eastern Meadowlark? It's, it's, it's hard to fathom. So we need to be diligent. We need to keep working. Um, it's, it's a tough fight, but we need to keep at it. Okay, we'll fill, fill some questions if you have uh, anything you want to ask them. Okay. I want to follow up one thing to your question. You, you said something, and I hear that from time to time. And uh, you asked where those Henslow sparrows went. Uh, folks, if you have a bird or an animal or a plant and it doesn't have its place any longer, there's not a vacancy sign out somewhere for that animal to go. And I think people have a misconception about that. I've worked at nature centers for 20 years now. People are always bringing us squirrels or bringing us possums or whatnot. Why do they think that there's a space for that animal at the nature center? There's not. 
that habitat's full. It's a healthy place. It has lots of reproducing animals in it. There's not a, a big empty hole for some animals to just up and move in there. And that is why habitat protection is absolutely crucial. We have to make sure that there are some spaces left for some animals because every time another house goes up, something's displaced, it has no place to go. That's what I hope you'll remember. Thank you. Okay. We've got a, a couple of uh, gifts for you guys, and thank you for your, your participation tonight. Well, thank you very much. Yours won't uh, explode for another 10 minutes. <laughs> Anyway, the, yours is fine. It's not loaded. It's just got ball bearings and black powder in it. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming this evening, and we'll see you all again in September. Thank you.